Hello, everyone that's here so far. Uh, my name is Sarah. I want to welcome you to today's webinar and let you know that we'll hang out for a couple more minutes and we'll get started uh, right at 12 today. Thank you. All right, it's 12 o'clock. I think we will go ahead and get started today. There's a lot of information that's going to be covered. So good afternoon. Again, my name is Sarah Love. I'm with Constellation Consulting, and we are pleased to present this behavioral health webinar series on tobacco and nicotine treatment. This series is funded by the New Mexico Department of Health, Tobacco Use Prevention and Control Program, and we will take and and it will take place each Friday through June 19th. We're very glad to have you here. And for more information about this series and the upcoming presentations, please visit our website, www.nmhealthequity.org slash behavioral health. Well, originally this was intended to be an in-person gathering, uh, this series on tobacco and nicotine treatment became a virtual series uh, this year due to COVID-19. We truly appreciate the efforts of everyone involved in trans transitioning this event online, including our presenters, the Department of Health, and the members of our Constellation team. And I'm sorry. <laughs> I got a little confused there. So for our session today, attendees, webcams, and microphones have been disabled. If you need assistance during the session, please utilize the chat feature in Zoom uh, or the Q&A as well. If you have a question for today's presenter, again, the chat down below or the Q&A is the place to be. And we will address as many questions as time allows. Uh, throughout the presentation, we have a few points to pause, um, or you can save them for the end as well. 
We do have an ASL interpreter with us today. Mr. Adam Romero is here. So if that service is needed for you, please pin his video uh, to your screen and you will be able to see him throughout the entire presentation. We will also offer a transcription of uh, today's and uh, all of the, the webinar series. Um, at some point after uh, we, we uh, post the, the, the video, um, it does take a little bit of time, so please be patient with us, but that will be there for you as well. And any materials provided by today's presenters uh, will be posted on our website at nmhealthequity.org, again, slash behavioral health. So for today's session, uh, we, we, you will receive an email with a link uh, at, at the end uh, for online evaluation. Uh, if you would like to receive CEUs for this hour, evaluations must be completed. Uh, your certificates will be emailed to you within 30 days of completion of the evaluation. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. And although our presentation today is virtual, we would still like to take the time to recognize the relationship between Indigenous peoples and their traditional territories. We would like to take this moment to honor and express gratitude to the 23 tribes of New Mexico, including 19 Pueblos, three Apache tribes, and the Navajo Nation as traditional stewards of this land. And as a white gender woman, a woman of European descent, I would like to apologize on behalf of my ancestors for any acts of land theft, sexual violence, enslavement, and genocide that have contributed to the colonization of any First Nation, Indigenous peoples, and any other people historically and presently in New Mexico, in our larger nation and internationally. May we promote healing across peoples through commitment to acknowledgments like this and commitment to being and doing better. So today we have a lineup of three presenters. First, we will hear from, from Esther, a cessation specialist with the New Mexico Department of Health Tobacco Use and Prevention Control Program. Esther has over 10 years experience working in primary care and ocular health settings and has eight years experience in public health with a primary focus on tobacco use prevention. In 2017, she joined the New Mexico Department of Health uh, two path program as cessation specialist, overseeing both the nicotine addiction treatment services and health systems change training and outreach program. And Dr. Kara Kikuchi and Suzanne Kress, both with Optum, uh, we hear from them after Esther. Uh, Dr. Kikuchi has over 13 years of experience in tobacco cessation and control, serving as manager of training and outreach program since 2015. She is responsible for the development and implementation of new programs and leads a team of system change specialists to meet training and outreach contract requirements. And Susan is a health system change specialist who works with healthcare providers from all disciplines throughout the state of New Mexico. She holds a Master of Science in Clinical Psychology and specializes in working with individuals who are challenged with severe and persistent mental illness and medical comor comorbidity. Her work involves tailored instruction as it relates to best practice clinical guidelines for behavioral and educational intervention with connection to nicotine cessation resources, along with facilitation of systems change that promote efficacy and sustainable programs to address nicotine dependence. You can read their complete bios on our website, nmhealthequity.org. And now please join me in welcoming our first presenter, Esther. Thank you, Sarah. Um... Well, thank you everybody for uh, attending today. And um, I, um, again, my name is Esther and I'm with the um, New Mexico Department of Health Tobacco Use uh, Prevention and Control Program, also known as TUPAC. And um, so today I will be discussing very briefly over the types of uh, service or cessation services and resources that we have available uh, through the state of New Mexico and uh, through our program. So first off, um, I just want to um, um, talk about our mission here at TUPAC, which is to improve the lives by eliminating the harm from tobacco abuse 
through the implementation of effective strategies that incorporate an anti-oppression model. So um, through the tobacco control program or anytime uh, when we hear about the word tobacco, what we're referring to is to, um, for tobacco is uh, on the commercial combustible tobacco products that the tobacco industry um, has produced and sold um, to the general public uh, here in the United States. We are not referring to the tobacco that is used in the uh, Native American communities um, during their ceremonial practices and rituals as we respect um, their cultural uh, practices. So let's go ahead and dive into the services that we offer through uh, TUPAC. So first of all, I just want to mention that the services that are offered here through our pro program is absolutely free and um, it is available to all New Mexicans who uh, want to quit tobacco use um, and any tobacco products that they're using. So um, our motto here at Tupac is to quit your way as we believe that um, individuals are very unique in how they uh, use their uh, cigarettes, for example, or e-cigarettes. And um, we provide several options um, and uh, of services uh, for them to enroll into. So for example, we have the 1-800-QUIT-NOW or the 1-855-DE-HULIA, which I'm sure many of you have seen our advertisements, um, our billboards um, on TV, on radios, for example. Um, so if you're or your clients or patients are interested, um, that's the phone number that they call into. The 1-800-QUIT-NOW is the English language, and then the 1-855-DE-HOLA-YA is the Spanish language. Of course, um, people can enroll um, online, um, so they can access it through quitnownm.com or deholoyanm.com. And again, these services are completely free. They're available 24 hours a day and seven days a week. So uh, of course, uh, just now I just mentioned that there are different uh, types of services for the public uh, to enroll into the program. The first type of services is what we call the phone-based services. In this type of um, program, um, Enrollees or what we call participants can um, enroll into the program via phone, obviously. They will receive 24 7 support from the quit coaches. Um, so, anybody that wants to call into the quit line at 3 a.m., there's always somebody that's available. And we have quit coaches all across the United States, and hence that's why we're open 24 7. Um, in addition to that support, uh, they have or they will receive a personalized quit plan in which they will work closely with a quit coach to um, understand for where the quit coach will understand how they use their tobacco products when they use it. Um, are they pairing it with coffee, for example, how long after they wake up um, do they start lighting up. And so each individual is very unique in how they use these tobacco products. So the quit coaches will uh, do a motivational interviewing to have that understanding. In addition, uh, enrollments will receive self-help materials through the mail. And um, of course, the unlimited sessions with a trained quit coach. So the quit line will make five outbound calls to the participants, but when participants want more support from quit coaches, then obviously they have um, unlimited um, number of times to call into the quit line. Of course, one of the major things that come out of the quit line uh, to the participants is the uh, free nicotine replacement therapies or the free patches, gums, or lozenge. So each enrollee will receive up to eight weeks of the free NRTs. And then of course, our quick coach receive um, extensive training um, to work with specialized populations such as um, the youth or pregnant woman, or uh, even those work uh, with the behavioral health conditions. So the second type of service that um, a participant can enroll into is the online service. So through the online service, they have a similar or very basically the same uh, benefits as they would enroll into the phone based services. The only difference here is that um, rather than talking with a quick coach, 
um, through the phone, they can actually chat with them online, um, like an instant messaging uh, type of service. And then another, another difference is that uh, they have access to the, a community forum, which the phone-based services does not um, have that capability. Of course, they will receive the free, up to eight weeks of free NRTs. Um, and then also, if a participant enrolls into the online services and feel like chatting is not um, one of, uh, something that they don't really wanna do, they have that option that uh, they can call into the uh, phone for um, phone support from the Quit Coach. So uh, from these two programs, the phone-based services and the web-based services, participants have the option to enroll into a text messaging support. So through this support, uh, they will receive up to 300 messages of tailored um, messages that uh, relate to their personalized quit plan. And these messages include um, quit coaching call reminders, motivational and educational reminders, and even um, just the information on how much money that they have saved from uh, purchasing tobacco products. And finally, the third type of service that a participant can enroll into is called the individual services or the a la carte services. Here, as the name implies, <clears throat> a participant can select any or all of the following options, um, either through text messaging services, a free two week starter kit, uh, a free patches, gums and lozenge with one coaching call, um, a quit guide or um, emails. I just want to make note that if um, participants choose the uh, starter kit, that they do not receive that eight weeks of NRTs, but rather just two weeks. But if they want additional uh, support in NRTs e or even uh, um, calling into the quit line for uh, quit coaching sessions, they will be able to upgrade into the phone based or the web based services. So um, that was just the portion of uh, resource that we have for the general uh, New Mexicans who use tobacco, but we also have resources available for those who um, are healthcare providers. So for example, as you can see here, here at Tupac, we have um, online trainings that are available for a variety of uh, healthcare professionals. Um, we have four online trainings that are targeted for just the general public. Uh, treating nicotine dependence in New Mexico. We have uh, trainings uh, that is specific for health professionals working uh, with families called Families Tobacco Intervention. And then a training that's specific for uh, dental providers. And then another training for, um, for behavioral health pro providers. In each of these training, um, it discusses about how to um, for healthcare professionals to approach their patients in providing a brief tobacco intervention, especially on the ask, advise, and refer piece, the two A's and R. So here is the online training for behavioral health uh, professionals, which you can um, go onto our website to access this um, particular training. And um, it's, it contains a great wealth of information about how tobacco impacts one uh, with uh, suffering from behavioral health conditions. We Another resource that we offer for healthcare professionals is the um, Health Systems Change Training and Outreach Program. Uh, I won't dive into uh, much detail into this program because um, our next presenter, Kara, will provide more information on that. But essentially, this training and outreach program is a free consultation training and technical assistance to help clinicians and um, providers to develop a robust and sustainable uh, tobacco referral treatment to available resources such as the 1-800-QUIT-NOW. Uh, we have other online resources for, um, uh, for providers. So here um, is our um, two-pack website that um, anybody can access to and it has a lot of great information such as uh, data information, fax referral forms to the 100 quit now. Um, if you want other, uh, the online trainings, for example, um, media information or program overview. So um, feel free to access our website um, to get more information. 
And then also what's very popular amongst the healthcare professionals is that um, they'll order our promotional materials where they can put it in their office um, to remind them that there is a resource or tobacco cessation resource that's available for not only for them, but also to the patients that they work with. So healthcare providers can order uh, quit now cards um, um, to give out to their patients. And even the acrylic stands that you see there and the uh, uh, provider reference cards. And so everything that um, we offer is completely free. So these materials are free and they're shipped out to you for free. And they're usually shipped within a week to 10 days. So um, that's all I have for now. Um, so, well, thank you so much for um, your support and uh, working with your patients as you guys um, have that opportunity to really work closely um, and influence their decision uh, to help quit tobacco use. Yay, thank you very, very, very much, Esther, for all that, that, those great resources. We do have a couple questions that came up. Um, one, one of the attendees says, hi, I have a question for Esther. She said recipients receive up to eight weeks of NRTs, NRT supplies. What happens after eight weeks if the recipient or even their physician or provider feels they need a longer supply? Yeah, so basically through the Quitline program, um, they have the ability to um, uh, re-enroll themselves into the program to get additional support. And so that includes uh, the coaching sessions as well as the, uh, the nicotine replacement therapies. Okay, great. And then uh, another attendee asks, uh, can you talk a little more about the training specific to behavioral health providers? Um, I think uh, this will be answered a bit as Kara and Suzanne uh, get, get going, but Esther, do you have anything you'd like to add? Absolutely. So this, uh, this training was, was developed about two years ago and it's a complete it's completely free. So it's a go at your own pace uh, type of training. So there it contains a lot of information about how uh, nicotine impacts the behavioral health conditions that um, a, a, a patient has. And at this time, a lot of the behavioral health providers uh, consider tobacco use or nic uh, uh, yeah, tobacco use as a harm reduction, but we want to educate providers that it is another type of nicotine or another type of addiction. So we would just want to uh, be clear and educate others that um, that we're, if, if behavioral health providers are telling uh, patients that, yeah, you can definitely use uh, smoke, we just want to be, uh, want to advise that, uh, that nicotine use you know, you're just replacing an addiction with another addiction. And I know uh, Kara will be able to provide more information on that. So, yeah. Okay, wonderful. Right and then we have one more question. Um, and I think that this will be the last one we have time for. Um, we'll let Kara get going. But uh, what ele electronic resources, like the cards and pamphlets, do you have for patients? Yeah. So at this time, uh, we don't have any uh, pamphlets, but we do have... Uh, quit now cards. They're like a credit card wallet size card that um, that you can provide and hand out to your um, patients if they're ready to quit within the next 30 days or something that they want to consider in quitting. In terms of electronic wise, we do have a fax referral form uh, that's available for providers to download and fill out and have um, fill out with patients information and fax it over to the 1-800 quit now. And that's something that is part of the health systems change training and outreach program that the specialists can work closely with the champions at these locations at the cl clinics to um, to incorporate into their their treatment system. Well, yes, well, great questions. Thank you. Great. So thank you so much, Esther, and thanks everyone for being here. Um, as Sarah said, uh, my name is Kara Kikuchi, and I manage the Health Systems Change Training and Outreach Program. And is everyone able to see um, the presentation, Stronger Together, a Systems Change Case Study? Is it looking okay? Okay, so um, today what we'll be doing is we'll talk about health systems change program that Esther mentioned. And then we will have Suzanne Kress, our specialist in the field, especially in the southern region of New Mexico. 
she can bring up uh, a case study with one of the health systems that she has been working with. And so um, we'll get started here by talking about what is health systems change. I mean, it is, you know, definitely a very um, academic sounding topic, right? And so basically what it means is that we're working with a, either a practice or a system of practice or some type of health system, behavioral health system, a clinic, a hospital system. And we're working on, on the workflow to treat patients and clients to address a specific topic and in a way that is systematic and, and efficient and so that clinicians and the staff can have a way of addressing, and in this case, nicotine addiction treatment. So we want to make sure that, um, that the resources that are being used are also really evidence-based as well. So, um, excuse me. So let's talk about what are the tools are, the best practices for healthcare providers. I mean, really, this is what we emphasize um, when when we're working with all all of our healthcare providers. And I should talk about the history of our health systems change program too. Um, we started in the state of New Mexico in 2014 with one outreach specialist covering the entire state. And then at that time, we were working with community health centers, federally qualified health centers, family practices, um, rural health clinics and hospitals, uh, Indian health services as well, and health systems within tribal and Pueblo communities. And then what we did is we grew to add a specialist. So we now have two in the field and expand our provider engagement so that we're also working with behavioral health providers and oral health providers as well. So as I mentioned, we base our work on the best practices for providers. And this continues to be this 2008 U.S. Public Health Services Clinical Practice Guideline. Um, it, it is, it, 2008 seems like it was so long ago, but this is still our gold standard for treatment. Um, the, the, guide, the original guideline was published in 2000 to help providers um, assist their patients who are using, patients and clients using t tobacco and, and nicot suffering from nicotine addiction. And the guidelines are based on, on a very exhaustive review and analysis of all of the current research and literature. Um, and then in 2008, this was updated with the, with the more recent studies. So the purpose of the guideline really is to help providers really understand that there's evidence-based recommendation for their clinical and system-wide interventions. And that if you use these guidelines, um, you're increasing the chance that your clients and, and patients will be likely to be able to succeed in quitting nicotine and tobacco. Um, you can find this full guideline on the CDC website as well. Um, but really what the, what the guideline mentions is that we wanna screen all patients for tobacco use and, uh, conduct a brief intervention, which I'll talk about a little bit here today, and then provide support in quitting. So counseling, um, medications, a discussion of these items, or possibly a referral for those, uh, for those services to be provided. And Esther mentioned all of the wonderful services that TUPAC is offering for the, the residents of New Mexico. So this is one of the tools, so the, one of the, the intervention tools that I just mentioned. Um, providers can be heavily involved, and especially with behavioral health providers, um, in, in supporting and utilizing this tool, but then also arranging um, support through the New Mexico Nicotine Addiction Treatment Services that Esther mentioned as well, 1-800-QUIT-NOW. Um, so the five A's, you've probably heard about it, ask, advise, assess, assist, and arrange. Um, this is the brief intervention that was developed by the National Cancer Institute. Um, the studies have shown that tobacco interventions that use this model are effective to help tobacco users quit. Um, but I will emphasize that for individuals with behavioral health concerns, or substance use disorders that are co-occurring, the, re the research does show that 
a more intensive intervention is required. So that would include a discussion of the medications to help with the physical addiction. And Esther had mentioned that um, nicotine replacement therapies like patch gum and lozenge, those items are available through the quit line. There are in total seven FDA approved medications to address nicotine withdrawal. So it's really important um, as a clinician to be able to address uh, that, that addiction piece. Um, there are additional resources to support health, behavioral health providers with understanding these medications and understanding what the brief model is and how to build upon the brief model. Um, I would say that the five A's can give you some general guidance, um, but your counseling skills, including any of your motivational interviewing skills, cognitive behavioral therapy, that will support you more, more fully in addressing um, your clients and your patients nicotine addiction. So, um, so the, you see the five A's on the left hand side, but there's also an abbreviated model that is the two A's and R, ask, advise, and refer. So as you can see that refer piece uh, can help address those last three A's. So that's where possibly you would ask about tobacco use, you would advise your client to, to quit tobacco and then refer to a resource, an evidence-based resource to support the assess, assist, and arrange portions. Now, um, if you work with our health systems change program, we will definitely give you guidance in and support in integrating this tool into your daily workflow and, and your um, treatment programs that you, treatment planning that you have with your clients. Um, refer, so I do want to point out one thing with the referral, Esther had mentioned the FACTS referral program, but I wanted to give you a, a, an example so you can see the FACTS referral form. It, it really directly connects the tobacco user to the, to the quit line and to 1-800-QUIT-NOW through, through the healthcare provider. And so because the program, it will result in a proactive call from the quit line to the tobacco user, it really eliminates that barrier of the tobacco user needing to initiate that first call to win 800 quit now. So it allows the provider or the clinic to ensure a proactive follow-up step after the first visit and then, or, or your first interaction that you've had and you've asked about tobacco use. And it gives that opportunity um, to, for the provider to take action and say, okay, this is a referral resource I think that you might be interested in, and here's our first step. I can help you with quitting. So best practices for health systems change. Really, it does give us a, an opportunity to improve your service to your clients, improve health, and then make sure that you're getting, giving effective and evidence-based care. Um, the, the CDC's best practices for comprehensive tobacco control programs uh, was published in 2014. This is definitely an evidence-based guide, and it states that um, effective tobacco control programs should really emphasize pre prevention and reducing tobacco use. Um, the, this version also talked about using health systems change as a way to in, incorporate the brief tobacco intervention into practice. So that this is where um, we, we definitely see the improvement with health systems change. The CDC also uh, recommended five keys for health systems change. And so our specialists really look at this when they're in the field and working with providers. And, and now, of course, you know, with COVID, we, we aren't in the field so much, but working remotely and working virtually with our, our healthcare providers. Um, as you can see, the five keys are, you know, really important to get an organizational commitment. So if you are working in a clinic or facility, you know, making sure your administrators are on board. So our specialists really uh, will work with those administrative staff, both clinical and non-clinical. And you'll hear from Suzanne about her work with the administrators and getting that organizational commitment. Uh, the team approach. So this is something important as well that you'll hear about. But really what, it, what, what this key emphasizes is that it's not any one provider's 
uh, full, sole responsibility. Any patient facing or client facing staff can engage in a brief intervention. And so it's helpful to really make sure that you have a sustainable way of engaging in these interventions. And then usually using quality improvement efforts. Um, I know Suzanne will talk about this as well, because this is something that really, uh, you know, was helpful in, um, uh, you know, supporting uh, the health system that she'll be talking about, um, really work towards systems change and addressing tobacco uh, in their facility in a systematic way. Um, developing electronic health records. So this one, it, you know, this certainly can be a challenge, but if, you're, if your health system is using an electronic record, um, if you use one for your notes in your private practice, if you have a way of incorporating the brief intervention into your system, that can help make sure that this is sustainable over the long term. And then integrating the care um, with internal and community resources. So that's just what we've been I've been talking about. It is just engaging those resources that are in your area that are especially evidence based, right? So the um, 1-800-QUIT-NOW, the web-based services, those a la carte services, um, you know, making sure that you can connect your, your clients to those community support systems. And our, our program goals, and as I've mentioned already, are we really want to help, help our, our providers build sustainable systems to address nicotine addiction and tobacco. Um, we'll support those, those systems in incorporating a brief intervention, at the least a brief intervention and hopefully even more intensive interventions. If, if you, uh, have, of course, are treating behavioral health uh, clients. And then um, assist those providers in making those referrals as needed to the community resources. I mean, in a nutshell, these, these are our uh, program goals. And then, uh, and what we do, Esther mentioned, is we offer technical assistance to help you create those systems and look at your workflow in your pra daily practice and, and help you fine tune it so that you are um, addressing uh, nicotine addiction. We have a five phase program that you can engage in with, at, and there's a very specific training curriculum, but it can be tailored to your specific practice or your specific site or clientele. And then we also offer those online trainings. So Esther mentioned the behavioral health online training. Um, and that is something that we find very much, um, you know, a tool that, that we use to help that the, the pr providers that we're engaging with make this, again, sustainable. So that maybe if you had staff turnover, you can make sure that they've incorporated the online training in part of their new hire training, um, that you're having your staff uh, take these trainings on an annual basis or even more frequently to make sure that this, this information is fresh in their head and that they're, that they're remembering to engage in tobacco and nicotine addiction treatment. And with that, overview of the background of health systems change and what it is. I will pass this along to um, Suzanne Crest, who will talk about her work with Messiah Valley Hospital. Hi, thanks, Kara. That was, that was really great. Um, the goal that I have here is to talk about what this work looks like in the field. So um, initially, I want to talk a little bit about um, the, kind of the lens that I have to that informs me with the work that I do. So I'll talk a little bit about um, systems change in general, and then, uh, then we'll be introducing Mesilla Valley Hospital in Las Cruces. So um, the first thing that is really important when working um, out in the field and with providers and organizations is to be able to establish rapport and to develop a good relationship. So this can at times mean that uh, program introductions and meetings um, can be, there can be multiple um, meetings for this. And many times you're working, I'm working with champions that have uh, responsibilities in some areas and they may be able to make decisions about going forward with program engagement. But in other cases, um, there may need to be discussions maybe in higher levels 
um, to really talk about what it means to do the work with the program and what it means for that program work to look like for the organization. So that's just, it's a really big part. It's something that, especially in behavioral health, um, has required potentially a couple of different meetings to establish that rapport. Um, additionally, it's really important for me to learn about the organization so that I can tailor the services for the resources and for the types of providers that I work with. And um, you'll get a good example with Mesilla Valley Hospital about multiple disciplines and multiple provider types. Um, additionally, I need to be learning and thinking about what it means for each organization to work as a team. So um, different uh, providers will have different educations, different viewpoints, and different roles within their organization. So being able to understand what it means to do an intervention, if that's um, uh, something that they're able to do, and then to be able to understand the resources and how to get um, a person connected in. It's very important. So um, the approach that I have in training uh, differs when I work with medical and even oral health providers um, from behavioral health providers. And even then within behavioral health providers, there's differences between the trainings that say therapists have versus case managers. Um, additionally, uh, in the medical setting, um, uh, and even in behavioral health medical settings, which you'll learn with uh, this case, is you also have technicians. So you have behavioral health technicians, medical assistants, nurses, and so on. And so there's different orientations, different thinking, different training. Um, additionally, what's um, also interesting, especially working uh, rurally, is when I'm working with um, clinics where uh, it's a smaller staff and people wear multiple hats, then um, their patients or clients may engage with uh, staff on it, it, at different touch points within their uh, visits into these clinics. So being able to have the entire staff understand what it would mean to do an intervention, to provide education, and then how to then connect into the resources. Um, additionally, I just want to make a note about working with uh, providers in private practice and that occasionally there, um, there is a sense of a burden, if you will, um, or an honor, if you want to look at it that way, where, you know, they're responsible for all providing all the interactions and all of the resources. So I, it's my job for, to be able to work with each provider and for them to understand in those cases where they can utilize the quit line as a tool in their toolbox so that they can refer their clients into the quit line. They understand what that means. They may even do an in-person referral where they make a call with the client and then how they continue with their sessions um, uh, and working with uh, alongside the quit coaching that can be involved in what the NRT that they receive can mean. So these are some of the things that I have to think about. Additionally, um, I need to look at the populations that are served. So I need to be aware um, that if a population is primarily homeless, you know, some of the concerns that we have are how do they have access to calling the quit line? Like they may not have a phone. Um, additionally, you know, they may not have an address for NRT to be mailed to. So these are some of the challenges. Additionally, there are um, there's good information and resource that needs to be provided for those for that population. Um, working with youth, youth um, not only gets uh, specialized services from the quit line, but there's also a, a specialized approach in working with youth. So being able to address and, and on honor and look at that with providers. Um, additionally, knowing whether the population um, is working with pregnant women. Um, and in amongst all of this, um, having an uh, trauma-informed approach to understanding that when you're working with individuals, um, there may be cir circumstances where there's guilt and there's shame around their tobacco use. And so being able to understand how to do an intervention, uh, knowing that there's potential to re-traumatize. Um, additionally, being aware also about multi multiple cultures. So working with LGBTQ plus community, being able to be aware of some of the special um, burdens that are upon them, uh, influences from the tobacco industry and a lot of pressures and understanding the stresses and why someone would actually um, use tobacco to begin with. So um, underpinning all of that is an understanding fundamentally of how a provider engages with their patient or their client. So does the engagement look like three to 10 minutes only? Um, is it possibly a little bit more, but, but no more than 30 minutes, much uh, being the case in the medical or oral health setting? Or is it a situation in say in behavioral health where 
um, a behavioral health provider can work with a client for individual sessions or group sessions where they have at least 50 minutes, sometimes 90, and it could be multiple times per week. And there can also be uh, multiple weeks uh, in, in, uh, in time, even months. So what does that intervention look like? What does that education look like? What are the resources? How can that be provided in a way that's clinically indicated? Um, so uh, just being able to have an understanding of that. Um, the, additionally, some of the things I have to think about are competing concerns. So when I come into a setting and I realize, you know, this is a very busy clinic or um, they're working with a population that's in crisis a, a lot of the time. So there's triage and detox potentially. But being able to understand and to honor um, trying to fold in in a tailored way that makes sense into all, in, into all kinds of settings with all kinds of potentially competing concerns. Um, additionally, it's very key to understand with some organizations um, what their community partnerships are like. So what does it look like to start an intervention, to start helping uh, a patient or a client, but then needing to have to do a nice smooth handoff into the community. Those are some of the things that I, that I think about. Um, mixed with all this is I just, I really need to be, it's very important to be flexible um, and just uh, through all of my communication modes, uh, I have great tools in my job to be able to allow me to be sensitive to providing information on the, when I'm out in the field and on the go. The other thing is um, I have the freedom uh, to provide multiple trainings per day. I train in the early in the morning, I can train in the evenings, and I can train on weekends and have those. So however it is to meet organizations and meet providers wherever they're at. Um, uh, additionally, I need to be aware of um, what can be a bias or a denial for nicotine treatment in varied settings. And uh, so that's just an elephant in the room. It's something that I've, uh, I, I, I see it uh, in many cases, and it's just something to be, for me, to be comfortable with, to talk about it, um, and to just be able to provide the research, and to just normalize the kind of dissonance that, that is uh, that it's in the room, if you will, and to be able to address uh, questions and concerns from everyone from a CEO all the way down to, you know, um, someone who's a tech who's not quite understanding how, why it would be important to provide this, the intervention in that setting. Um, and um, I've received um, uh, um, uh, resistance to nicotine treatment, not just in behavioral health, but in medical, um, in medical settings as well. So it's not only on behavioral health. But um, there is a, a pervasive historical um, bias towards um, not providing nicotine treatment. Um, so one of the things that I keep in the forefront of my mind is recognizing the strengths that providers provide and possess when they're facing change. And I've seen it happen. I've seen it happen in the moment, and I've seen it happen over time. It's an amazing thing when the conversation starts to happen, the resources are provided, and people lean in and just move into it. Even, even though they're not quite sure what's going on, they possess a great deal of strength when it comes to change. So another statement about uh, systems change work, this is something where we usually start with something kind of small and a very reachable goal, um, depending on the setting. And we, um, we deploy that first goal and uh, project, if you will. And then it's a process of implementing that finding out what things work, what things don't work, revisiting it, measuring it, being able to measure, is this working? Can we audit charts? Can we look to see if the interventions are happening? You know, the screenings, the interventions, and then the connection into resources. And then being able to make adjustments and coming back in, implementing those changes, and then uh, moving forward and still, again, being able to measure how are things working? Do we have real data? And, and can we really understand um, if this is really working? So I want to make a note about training. We come in and we do trainings that are in two part. The first one um, is, you know, talking about the problems, the health effects, um, and the benefits to quitting. Um, but, and then we go into the interventions. The second part is connecting into resources and being able to explain um, much of what uh, Esther talked about with TUPAC and uh, um, all the resources that are available. And then just to say that embedded in with this, um, all of this work, from the very beginning uh, discussions to the very end, um, is looking at documentation, looking at provider ongoing training, um, evaluating their intervention skills, and just making sure that they have an effective program that is sustainable, which means as people come and go in their jobs, which they do, that there's some sort of program left behind 
where the next person can come in, the next champion, if you will, can come in and just pick up and keep things going. So um, just a, a note about that. So I want to paraphrase um, a statement that was made um, at, by the keynote speaker on Wednesday for the NM Act conference, uh, Leo Manzano. And he had made a statement that just really struck me. And he said, resources that live online are great, but there's no substitute for showing up, knocking on the door and saying, here I am and here are some resources. So that's, that really inspired me because I was, I, I know that. Um, I've got firsthand experience that this has been um, a really um, uh, satisfying and, and enjoyable experience to be able to, to deliver this. So now, uh, Tara, if you want to advance the slide, that'd be great. So introducing Mesilla Valley Hospital in Las Cruces. Um, what was really interesting about this, this is a larger organization. And when I was doing work um, elsewhere in the community, I just had some extra time and decided, you know what, I, I think I want to just stop in and see if I can get some information, you know, like a business card or a name of an individual that I can just connect with later and get an appointment. So I ended up um, in the lower slide on the right hand, uh, if you look at the facility on the right hand side, and I walked into a smaller building and I, it happened to be the outpatient services building. And I walked in and right in the milieu of what was happening, I went ahead and asked as the, if there was a clinical supervisor available. And sure enough, here she came. I mean, I was just amazed. Um, she came with a smile on her face. And, and as soon as I started to describe our program and talking about um, some of the uh, meaningful measures and, and accreditation pieces and parts, she just immediately got excited. And I mean, she brought me back into her office and, and I was just completely surprised that she was carved out her time. She sat down and we had a really great discussion right off the top. So um, just to back up a little bit and let you know what kind of organization we have, I wanna introduce them as and say, they are a psychiatric hospital located in Las Cruces, uh, offering treatment of mental health and substance use conditions for children and adolescents ages 10 and up, along with adults. Um, in operation since 1987, the facility provides quality behavioral health care to residents from New Mexico, Texas, and Arizona. And it is fully accredited by the New Mexico Children, Children Youth, and Families Department, the Joint Commission, and is TRICARE certified. They went tobacco-free um, and established that policy in July of 2017. I began working with them um, late, late that year in the fall of 2017. This is in, um, just, just to put things in context, there are uh, other facilities within the community that do allow combustible tobacco use, uh, use as part of their treatment. And even in despite that, uh, Mesilla Valley Hospital wanting to provide the highest level of care um, and for their patients that they refer to their, um, the population they serve as patients. So you will hear me refer to their uh, participants as patients as opposed to clients, which is normal in behavioral health. Um, but despite what, was, uh, what other offerings there were in the community that allowed for um, tobacco use, they decided to uh, do the right thing and go tobacco free. They have 250 total employees. This, they also have a cafeteria and administrative, so including janitorial staff and so on, 250. So this is a large organization. They have 37 behavioral health therapists, um, included uh, amongst that are psychiatrists and psychiatric nurse practitioners. They have about 100 nurses and mental health technicians. Um, so they have a hybrid of medical providers and behavioral health providers, as well as, and we talked about the levels of training too. So um, they have three basic department programs. Uh, they have an inpatient services uh, program, which is licensed for 103 acute psychiatric beds, 41 being as adolescent and 62 for adults. Um, they have uh, an adolescent residential treatment uh, center for, that has 16 beds, and they have an outpatient services program uh, run for adults and uh, adolescents. They run three groups uh, per day, one adolescent and two adults, and they run also individual and medication management uh, meetings uh, with psychiatrists and so on. So they have a multidisciplinary team approach. In outpatient, they have individual and, and group settings over several weeks. And the average stay for a person on inpatient can be anywhere from three to, to 14 days, depending. Of note is um, between 25 and 30% of the individuals who uh, in, uh, experience inpatient services 
um, elect to participate in the outpatient services. So a note to say that about 75% of the individuals who've done an inpatient stay um, depart from their, um, their organization. And this, this provides uh, um, the opportunity in inpatient to provide intervention and education around tobacco and nicotine. You know, it's uniquely upon their shoulders um, to do that. Additionally, without patient, they also um, don't, they include people that have not um, participated in patient. So they, they also are the first um, potential uh, contact for um, patients to provide an intervention and, and uh, education. So uh, when, so going back to that first cold call sit down and having a great conversation, you know, we talked about JCO. We talked about what accreditation um, pieces and parts, what the JCO P, um, Commission wants to see in terms of intervention and referral to resources, what that looks like when you document that kind of thing, and and in looking at what's with follow up. So we had a really great discussion about that. Um, then we also talked immediately for that particular department, it made sense to talk immediately about a, the fax referral system. So um, what was really interesting, and, and we also scheduled training for that staff back, this would have been in early uh, 2018. So what was really interesting is this is sort of that pilot study within their larger organization that we'd launched. And we wanted to just see, you know, how that would work and, and, um, and then kind of see how things might need to be adjusted and work from there. So there, I just want to mention that there's time that um, occurred in between and to mention that, you know, I, I travel quite a bit. I have other commitments and other communities and other organizations. So there was a time lapse, but at some point um, it was really nice to get my inpatient or my outpatient champion to do a really nice handshake um, introduction um, and open the doors for me to sit down with um, directors of the facility on the inpatient side. I mean, they, they were directors over the entire organization, but we had a really nice directors meeting, which included um, the CEO, the CNO, an inpatient side, the CFO, and other uh, management folks. And it was really interesting to come in and start really diving into what does it mean to do nicotine cessation work in this setting? And we were able to immediately start talking about um, you know, the, the understanding of how and why nicotine treatment is important um, in discussing it in as part of a treatment plan, understanding their competing concerns, their concerns about crisis and so on. And we had a really nice conversation about how when uh, one of their patients comes in initially, they're potentially going through one of the toughest times in their lives. And when they come into care, one of the things that the cup is half full is when they're put on NRT, they are immediately on a combustible tobacco or tobacco or vaping quit. And that is a really positive thing because now they're in a setting where they not only have nicotine replacement therapy, therapy and medical um, help, medication help, but they also are in a very nice setting to be monitored and supported um, throughout that inpatient stay. So it was important to have a discussion about right at intake when they do the assessment and they're looking at nicotine dependence to be able to say, um, while you're here, you're actually gonna be on a tobacco quit. And with our help, we're gonna be able to help you while you're here. And then we have information that can help when you discharge as to how you can continue and work with the quit line and so on. So it was a really great um, opportunity and conversation to have that despite thinking, well, our patients are in crisis a lot of the time. Um, it was very clear when I walked away from that meeting that this organization wanted to provide the best gold standard service that they could. And they just got very energized and enthused and they're like, okay, we've got a lot of moving parts here. Um, we've got all this staffing that we need to kind of figure out, but they really were motivated to let's make this happen. It was really a very satisfying experience. Um, and right then and there, we started scheduling to have me work with their nursing staff. And um, I, it's of note, we ended up doing two trainings a day, March 11th and 12th. And I had an additional outpatient retraining uh, that was scheduled on the 13th. And so we did an amazing training. The, the um, uh, staff was very open to um, asking questions. We did a lot about um, how does quitting combustible tobacco in the body and how does that affect medica other medications? Um, especially psychotropic with side effects and how can we help to monitor them and understand how medica medication management needs to happen in these circumstances. We had a really good conversation about 
when you're delivering nicotine replacement therapy in the form of gum or lozenge, you can break that habit of having that um, cigarette with the first cup of coffee, um, understanding you know, how they can initially start breaking some of those paired behaviors. Um, it was a really great response from the, from the nursing staff. So what happened was after that uh, March 12th last training, the next day I, was, I received a phone call about two hours before the outpatient uh, training that said we, that the hospital had gone into COVID lockdown. And so uh, what happened was I had a conversation with my outpatient champion. We said, you know what, things are really crazy right now, but let's stay in touch because we wanna be able to um, continue this work virtually. And I just wanna say that I've continued and I've done seamless virtual trainings um, and meetings with uh, both their therapists and the outpatient therapists and, and uh, nurses. So um, I know we're short on time here. So I just want to say that um, they're, the, in future thoughts, we're just continuing to deepen their work. We're working hand in hand with the restrictions and, uh, and hiccups with COVID um, that they have as a collective, collab they've been collaborative and positive. They have a can-do professionalism. And um, I'm just a, a huge fan, if you can't tell already. Um, translating work into smaller clinics, I hope I've addressed that a little bit more. Um, the biggest takeaway is um, we are as available in our program uh, for you. We, are, we will tailor whatever it is that we need to do for your needs. And, um, you know, all of the work and everything that we can bring forward to you will absolutely meet you wherever you're at. So thank you for, um, for letting me present today. Yeah, and I just want to circle back a little bit here before we close out is that, you know, it goes back to our goals and that what we hope as a result of all of this work that Suzanne has done with Messiah Valley Hospital and that they've done collaborative, collaboratively is that we have that culture shift that is starting and continues to go on in behavioral health communities that that really emphasizes the need to treat nicotine addiction and that the benefits of that will only help their clients and patients and that we hope to see more more clinicians throughout the state and more behavioral health providers that are willing to address the nicotine addiction and then um, we see the numbers of those sustainable systems go up throughout the state statewide so thank you so much thanks for your time I hope we have time for a few questions as well. This, I'm sorry, this is the information if you want to reach Suzanne, and this is the Health Systems Change. There's a video describing our program as well on the um, NM2PAC website. I'll leave it here if you want to get Suzanne's uh, contact information. Great, thank you both so very much, Kara and, and, and Suzanne. That was wonderful information. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, so it looks like uh, uh, Suzanne went ahead and typed her her um, email into the the chat box. It's one o'clock now. Um, we have just um, uh, you know, if you want to hang out, we have a, a question that came up in the chat function. Um, Brittany asked, how long is the training and who should uh, be at the training? And Kara responded in the chat, but I also wanted to, to read it here in case anyone else had a similar question. Uh, Any client or patient facing staff or clinicians are encouraged to attend the training. Depending on the need of the practice or providers, we have one or two sessions at 30 to 60 minutes each. All right, great, thank you. And that, that's the only question that, that came up so far during this, this part of the presentation. Um, so thank you. All right, so if we can uh, advance to the next slide, thank you very much. And uh, just it's 101 now, so uh, just a, a quick reminder to join us next week uh, where we will talk about the topic, uh, nicotine use is substance abuse. I think that was covered a little bit today. Thank you, Kara and Suzanne and Esther for, for, um, for, for presenting that. Um, Dr. Chad Morris, the Director of Behavioral Health and Wellness Program, uh, along with Jeff Holland, who's the director of Endorphin Power Company, uh, Transitional Housing um, here in Albuquerque will, will, will be here to present. And this uh, video um, of this presentation today will live on the website nmhealthequity.org slash behavioral health. 
uh, if you want to view it again, and we'll have a trans trans transcribed version as well. So thank you all again for attending. I hope you have a wonderful afternoon.